be recorded. So, okay, so now we're recording. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the RQMP uh, Finance Banner Seminar. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Mark Rudner, uh, who is joining us from Copenhagen. Uh, Mark was born and raised in California. Uh, he did his PhD at MIT uh, and then a postdoc at Harvard. And in 2012, I believe around there, he landed at Niels Bohr Institute, uh, University of Copenhagen uh, as a faculty member where he's now an associate professor. Uh, he's worked on many, many interesting things. Um, he's interested in quantum dynamics and in many body physics in general. He's done a lot of work on the control of uh, solid state uh, qubits, uh, nonlinear dynamics, spin systems, topological systems, floquet topological system, um, and many other things. I find his talks uh, usually clear and interesting, and that's why I invited him uh, to come talk with us today. So uh, welcome at least virtually to Montreal, Mark. The floor is yours. Uh, let me just remind people, if you want to ask a question, it's just it's okay to just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, if you're too shy, you can type it, and I will try to find a good time uh, to ask the question. So please, Mark. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sammy, for the introduction. I guess the pressure is on now, to be clear. Um, yeah, thanks also for the invitation. This is my first time in Montreal, uh, virtually or otherwise, and I hope that you know, once it's possible to actually travel again, there'll be more opportunities to, to visit in person and, and meet all of you. Uh, okay, so um, before I before we jump into the physics at hand, I wanted to spend a minute to just kind of set up the, the broader context in which this work uh, took place. Um, and there's an, sort of an idea or a way of thinking that I've been pursuing for a while now. Uh, which is based on the following idea, that if we take a quantum anybody system and, and push it out of equilibrium, then there are various types of internal fields that can be present, such as um, an AC internal electric field or AC or DC internal currents that flow, which would not be possible in equilibrium. Uh, and through electron-electron interactions, those internal fields may, may feed back onto the material itself and in some way modify the underlying uh, quantum fabric of this material, meaning say the band structure or various properties of it. And, and this can lead to interesting new types of nonlinear dynamics or you know, phase transitions and different things. So, so this is kind of the, the context in which I've been thinking. And this particular example that I'm going to illustrate in this talk is one, one example of that, but there are many other types of examples along these lines. And at the end, we can, we can discuss other directions uh, you're interested in hope it'll be a way to spark some conversation. Um, okay, so as the title suggested, spontaneous symmetry breaking is a key part of this uh, story. So I thought maybe it'd be good to start off and just make sure we're all on the same page in terms of this concept that is, should be familiar uh, from basic physics education. Um, so spontaneous symmetry breaking, you know, it's a fundamental concept in, in the way that we describe uh, phases of matter and phase transitions. And if I can just formulate it into one statement, uh, I would like to say that uh, you know, given a physical system, which is governed by either some statistical or dynamical equations, of some sort which possess a certain set of symmetries, then we can characterize the states obtained in that system according to which of those symmetries are respected and, and which are broken. So a you know, classic example is, is the difference between a liquid uh, and a solid. Whereas the liquid on average preserves the continuous translation symmetry of space, the solid uh, breaks it down to uh, discrete translation symmetry. Uh, but there's nothing specifically equilibrium about this uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking concept that I mentioned. You could also imagine a dynamical system with some equations of motion that are invariant under a certain set of symmetries. Uh, and the state of the system, say a steady state that it comes to, may or may not respect those symmetries. And, and that's the type of spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, that I'll be focusing on in this talk. It'd be a dynamical uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in an out of equilibrium system. Okay, so the so basic plan in the first part of the talk, I'll review a bit about uh, 
very curvature and semi-classical dynamics of electrons in, in materials and how they're related to band structure properties. Uh, and then I'll discuss um, dynamical feedback and how internal fields and specifically AC internal electric fields related with plasmonic motion can modify the electronic properties of the system. Uh, and then finally put the pieces together and, and show you this spontaneous symmetry breaking phenomenon that uh, we've been studying. Okay, so, so starting point for all this is we need to think back to how electrons move uh, through a solid. Uh, and we all know from basic solid state physics that uh, an electron in a periodic potential uh, has a dispersion relation, which is organized into bands, the band structure. And that was known since the thirties. Uh, and the interesting part of the story is that for some reason it took from the thirties until more or less the early 2000s for the community to really appreciate that not only when we diagonalize the block Hamiltonian and, and find a dispersion relation, uh, do we get a bunch of eigenvalues which give us the energies, uh, but also the eigenstates that corresponds to, you know, if I pick a particular crystal momentum in a given band, there's a block eigenstate corresponding to that crystal momentum. And uh, the structure of how these block eigenstates are laid out over the Brillouin zone actually has very important consequences for how electrons move in a solid, and in particular, how they respond to forces. Um, and so one way of characterizing uh, how these block eigenstates are laid out in the Brillouin zone is through the so-called Berry curvature. So, so if you imagine uh, focusing on some crystal momentum value, some particular band, uh, and then scan along in this band. So if you would say apply a force to an electron, uh, you would find that it accelerates by its momentum changing. Uh, and along the way, its block eigenstate in the Hilbert space will also have to change uh, in some smooth way as, uh, as it tracks the, the momentum as it's changing. Uh, and this fact that the wave function of the electron has to sort of adiabatically follow uh, along as its momentum changes, uh, that's what gives rise to uh, some highly non-trivial behavior uh, that you wouldn't expect, say, just by looking at the dispersion itself. And mathematically, we can characterize this uh, phenomenon through the Berry curvature, which tells essentially if I would make a small loop, this electron would traverse a small loop in momentum space, uh, what's the you know, area on the block sphere if this had been a two band system. So this block sphere would represent uh, components of the wave function, say two, lattice, two sub lattices. Uh, the area swept out on this block sphere would give us a Berry phase. So, so the Berry phase uh, per unit area in K space that swept out, that's, that's given by this Berry curvature. And that'll play a fundamental role in this story. So, so one way to see what the effect of this Berry curvature is, is to, to look at the semi-classical equations of motion that govern how an electronic wave packet uh, moves through this material in the presence of, say, electric and magnetic fields. And, and this talk actually uh, will be setting magnetic field equal to zero, so we can ignore that. But if we look at those equations, and they're relatively straightforward to derive, if you haven't seen it, I recommend this uh, review of modern physics down here. It's kind of a uh, Bible on the subject. Uh, but if we look at these equations of motion for the sort of the center of mass position and momentum of the wave packet, you'll find they look very much like the equations of motion for a classical particle. Uh, the velocity, it's like a group velocity, has a derivative of the dispersion. But there is this second piece that contributes to the velocity uh, and is proportional to this Berry curvature, which had to do with how the block eigenstates are laid out in momentum space. Uh, and you see it's kind of analogous to the Lorentz force here. Uh, we know if there's a magnetic field applied, then we get a force which is perpendicular to the velocity of the particle. Uh, and so this anomalous velocity term, which shows up here, it's, it's a phase space dual to this Lorentz force in the sense that we reverse the roles of X and P. So instead of having a velocity here, we have P dot sort of velocity for momentum. For momentum uh, but remember, P dot is just a force. It's applied, that's Newton's law. Uh, so this funny extra contribution to the velocity, we see it's something that's 
proportional to the force applied. It's not an acceleration though, it's a velocity. So it's some kind of velocity instantaneous response uh, to a force that pushes on the electron. And through the cross product, we see that it's a perpendicular velocity to the force. So say you, you know, push on this electron in the x direction, it'll pick up a velocity in y, and the velocity will be proportional to how hard you push. So it's, it's kind of a weird uh, way of an electron responding to a force. Um, but just to give some intuition, uh, it's, very, it's a concept that we're all very familiar with, because if you've ever played with a gyroscope, that's exactly what happens. You spin this gyroscope, and then either you let gravity push on it or you do it with your finger and you find that it doesn't fall over, but instead it actually processes in the perpendicular direction. Uh, and the rate of precession is proportional to how hard you push. So, so that's exactly the nature of this term here that appears uh, rather generically in the equation of motion for electrons in a material. Uh, and given the transverse nature of it, that it's perpendicular to the force, you can see that it'll give rise to a Hall-like response because if we get this force coming say from an electric field along X, we'll end up with current flowing along Y. So, so this anomalous velocity is also responsible for, for Hall-like effects. Okay, uh, any, any question about that while I pause to drink? No, okay. So, so that's about single particle uh, dynamics here, uh, but we'll be interested in dynamics of material with many electrons in there in a metallic regime. Uh, so to find out what's the collective Hall response coming from this uh, anomalous velocity, we basically have to just add up the contributions from all the electrons over the Fermi C. So if we imagine some you know, metallic system, it has a say two dimensions uh, and has a Fermi C in all of these modes in case space are build up, then to get the total current that flows, in particular the total Hall current that flows due to anomalous velocity, we just need to add up all these contributions and it'll give us a Hall conductivity, at least an intrinsic, it's called the intrinsic contribution to the Hall conductivity, which is proportional to the integral of the Berry curvature over all of these, this region of filled states in momentum space. And that's integral of Berry curvature over the field states in momentum space is referred to as the Berry flux and has a symbol I'll be using uh, math cal F. Uh, so whenever you see this math cal F, it's just the integrated Berry curvature or the Berry flux. Um, and it'll play a central role in the discussion. So, so there's one interesting property about this Berry flux I just want to highlight uh, because it's kind of somewhat important later and it was important also just in the calculation along the way, which is you know, it looks like somehow a property that involves the entire Fermi C. Uh, but in fact, it is a Fermi surface property. So, so you can relate through Stokes theorem, this integral over the whole area of the Fermi C to just an integral, essentially the Berry phase you get by going around the Fermi surface. Uh, and so it, it's sufficient to understand what's happening to the electronic states at the Fermi surface to understand uh, any changes that are induced to the Berry flux and hence the Hall conductivity. And that's what we'll be focusing on uh, in a bit. So I'm sorry, may I ask a question? And yeah, so for sure. Is this second equality there valid only for zero temperature or uh, where f of p is say one or zero or? Yeah, so, so this is for zero temperature. Um, you know, at, at non-zero temperature, if it's a very small temperature, then it should be close to equal. But of course there isn't a perfectly sharp Fermi surface there. So you'd have some correction to it. Uh, but yeah, if we take it at zero temperature, then it's a strict equality. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, good, anything else? Okay. I have, a, not, I have a question. Okay. What happens in the extended zone scheme? Because it's only periodic in the reduced scheme, right? If it goes from one zone to the next zone, how does that influence what's going on here? Um, you, you mentioned periodicity. Which, which periodicity do you have in mind? The, the, the thing that defines the size of the Brillouin zone. Right, so, so here um, I'm imagining, say, eventually we'll use graphene as an example, which is doped uh, slightly away from charge neutrality. So, so the region of filled states in momentum space is a small fraction of the Brillouin zone. Uh, so really the, you know, the 
overall extent of the Brill one zone won't play any role in the discussion. Uh, if you consider an insulator, so, so the same property, if you would fill a band completely, uh, then the integral of this Berry flux over the complete band would give you uh, an integer, which is the churn number, and gives you quantized Hall conductivity. But here it's just over some very limited region uh, of the Brill one zone. Did that answer the question? No, I'm more interested in, in reality, it'll go from the first Brillion zone to the second Brillion zone as you apply the force. And then oh, you have to reduce it, it back it. into the first zone. And is that influencing how these phases come out? I see. If you would apply a, a DC electric field and leave it on for a long time, then yeah, this uh, electrons would, would move throughout the entire Brillion zone and make some kind of block oscillation. Uh, and wrap around and come back. Uh, you would see some kind of oscillatory response in the longitudinal direction. It, it depends then it, what happens over long times if you leave this electric field on, you have to you would have to uh, track this Berry curvature across the entire Brill one zone. But for the purpose of this discussion, uh, we'll be talking about small amplitude uh, AC modulation. So this Fermi surface will uh, oscillate back and forth, but only by a tiny fraction of its size. So, so we'll never be exploring the entire below one zone here. It's an interesting question, but sort of uh, goes okay, to a separate you. direction. Thanks. Right. Good. OK, so that's uh, some history and some sort of uh, background for what I want to discuss. Now, over the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of work uh, investigating both theoretically and experimentally uh, the extent to which band structure properties can be modified dynamically uh, in time by applying AC fields to, to material. And um, actually, Tammy in particular has done uh, many interesting works in this direction. I've been involved in, as well as many others. Uh, and the sort of mechanisms for changing to uh, band structure in this way uh, can be categorized into a few different uh, flavors or proposals. So, so one is, is the number of works discussing optically induced anomalous Hall effects, uh, in particular in graphene and graphene-like systems. Uh, and here the idea is basically that uh, graphene is a non-magnetic material by itself and it has no Hall conductivity, it respects time reversal symmetry, but if you apply a circularly polarized laser driving field on it, coming in at normal incidence, then this circularly polarized drive, uh, it has a handedness to it, which, which breaks time reversal symmetry. It breaks whatever symmetry might have been preventing graphene from having uh, Hall conductivity. Uh, and then in the presence of this drive, you may expect to see uh, a Hall effect appear. Uh, and not only that, in, in some very, very favorable at least theoretical conditions, you might even hope to see something close to a, a quantized Hall effect produced uh, in the presence of this drive. And there's even a very beautiful experiment that came out last year, uh, which saw very clear signatures of this uh, kind of behavior. Uh, another class of proposals, which uh, have been uh, discussed at length, which has been exploring uh, in detail how periodic drives can modify not only the uh, dispersion or geometry of bands, but, but also their global topology and, and trying to understand uh, what new features of uh, band topology can we find in driven systems in particular, which may be different from uh, in non-driven or equilibrium systems. Okay, so, so the many works in this way, essentially just trying to understand what kind of control do we have by using AC fields over the properties of of bands and this very curvature, and how can we thereby modify the way that electrons move through materials? Uh, and there's a number of experiments besides this one in graphene I mentioned. There are ultra fast experiments spectroscopically looking at how the band structure is modified in the presence of a drive, and many, many experiments in uh, atomic and optical physics applying these ideas and, and seeing what they can do uh, in that way. Okay, so this basically sets the background and now we're going to put these ideas together with, with some twist uh, to look for some new physics in the nonlinear regime. Uh, so before I move on there, just 
pause one more time if there's any questions on the introductory part of the talk. No, okay. So now I'd like to make the following proposal, which is sort of the starting point of my own thinking for coming into uh, this problem that I'm going to discuss, which is that up until not that long ago, uh, band structure was basically a fixed property of a material. And if you didn't like the band structure you were given, you weren't happy with whatever the properties of the material were, you'd have to find a chemist to grow you a new material, put different atoms there, different arrangement, and you could get a different band structure. Uh, and the lesson of these works from the past 10 years or so that I mentioned is essentially that if we allow ourselves to dynamically drive materials, then this band structure is, is now essentially malleable. We have ways of, of tuning it in situ without growing a whole new material. Uh, but that was all basically single particle physics that I was talking about. And most of those works as well are, are thinking about uh, how this drive just modifies the single property, single particle properties of the spectrum. Uh, now, what I would like to discuss is the following idea that if we bring electron electron interactions into the picture and think about them more seriously, uh, this band structure now can actually become a dynamical variable of its own. Uh, and acquire some dynamics which are coupled to the dynamics of the electron. And, and this coupled dynamics of the electrons and the band structure itself will lead to some interesting new phenomena. Okay, so, so to just illustrate, you know, where, where is this line of thinking coming from? I wanna consider the case of uh, plasmon, plasmonic excitation. So a plasmon is basically uh, an oscillating charge density wave in a metallic system. Uh, and when this oscillating charge density wave is excited, then due to the fact that it'll have some regions with a little bit of excess negative charge and some with an excess positive charge, there'll be internal electric fields that are generated when I excite a plasmon. Uh, and these internal electric fields can actually be extremely intense. Um, so I, I just took a picture from this experimental paper here, not for any particular reason about the geometry of the experiment, but uh, it established some kind of record for uh, field compression, meaning that uh, the intensity of electric fields that were observed in this experiment were, I think, a, about a billion times more intense than at a comparable frequency uh, in free space, uh, because plasmonic wavelengths are much smaller than you know, comparable electromagnetic waves in free space. So the point is that we can get very strong oscillating electric fields just for free inside of the material. Uh, and then if we bring this together with those ideas from so-called Floquet band engineering, then you can imagine the following scenario that if I excite this plasmonic mode in the material that produces an electric field, which the electrons inside the material will then feel. You know, from the point of view of some electrons sitting inside this material, it's gonna feel an AC, a very strong, in fact, AC electric field. It has no way of knowing, is this because somebody shined a laser from the outside and now I should be thinking I'm in a Floquet band somewhere or is this electric field coming from my neighbors? It's just seeing an AC electric field. And those works that I discussed told us that if electrons in a band are subjected to an AC electric field, in particular, suppose it's circularly polarized, then that, in the context of say this graphene band structure, which I've illustrated here, could say open a gap there and generate a Hall conductivity, which is now not equal to zero, whereas it was zero before. Uh, and now that the Hall conductivity is non-zero, that's going to change the nature of this plasmonic excitation because now it's something analogous to a magnetoplasmon. We have some plasmon in the presence of Hall conductivity. And that sets up a feedback loop and can lead to some new nonlinear dynamical phenomena uh, when we take into account that not only is there this collective excitation of the electrons, but that it might be influencing the underlying band structure itself. So that's the concept. Uh, and now I wanna illustrate it with a specific example to, so we can see how this all uh, plays out. I think there's a question, Ranjani, are you, do you wanna ask? Hi. 
so I just had a question about this generation of uh, internal air fields. So could this also result in a Rashba kind of a spin orbit coupling? Um, so yeah, if, if the field had a strong out of plane uh, component, then it would break in, say break inversion symmetry and you could imagine it'll lead to a Rashba like effects. So that's a good point. So the only thing that we need to keep in mind is that it'll be an AC field. So maybe to have some AC Rashba effect, I'm not sure what the result would be, uh, but it's interesting to think about uh, what the consequences. So like, could it be thought of uh, as a time varying uh, Rashba spin orbit coupling and could that lead to interesting effects? I can't pinpoint what the effect would be, but I think it's an interesting question to explore it for sure. I, I, it's, I haven't thought about it, but it's, it's a good idea. Uh, so we can, we can discuss it later. Thanks. And I have another question. Uh, so you're exciting this plasmon. Yeah. Um, how long lived is it? Ah, so you can actually imagine this is in a continuous wave. So you can keep the, the example I'll discuss actually will imagine keeping the drive on. Uh, we can also discuss how long lived is it. So in, in graphene, uh, high quality devices, which have been measured to now, the record is a uh, quality factor of a few hundred. So that means a few hundred periods of oscillation it can live. Uh, and in those experiments, they you know, characterize the sources of loss and expect that you can get up to maybe about a thousand, something like that for the quality factor. So that, that gives you a time scale for how long it could live on its own. Which is also a very interesting question of how long this thing, if you don't keep driving it, it'll give some memory to the effect and, and how that goes. And that's a direction I'd like to explore more, actually. Okay. Any, anything else? Okay, not let's uh, now come to a sort of concrete realization of this. And so, so I wanna illustrate with the simplest possible model we could think of uh, just to sort of demonstrate the effect as a proof of concept. And so, so I'm going to consider a metallic disc. Uh, and so metallic disc, it consists essentially of a, a positive background that's fixed in space, it's stuck to the table, and then electrons, which are negatively charged and, and free to move relative to the background. Um, and then you can see if you displace the electrons relative to the positive background as shown on the page, there'll be an electric field that points from the exposed positive charge to the excess negative on the other end. So, so this is exactly the internal field that I'm talking about. Uh, and then if you would release the electrons, you can imagine that they'll start oscillating back and forth. It's a dipole mode of this disk. And then we have an AC internal field, which is present. And, and now we can start to analyze what are the effects of this AC internal field and, and you know, what's this nonlinearity that I uh, mentioned. So this will be kind of a workhorse for the rest of the talk, this, this disk. Okay, so, so if we have a perfectly circular disk of an isotropic material, then this dipole oscillation mode will be doubly degenerate. So if we imagine you know, applying an AC excitation and sweeping the frequency, we'll find a peak uh, at this dipole resonance. And there are two polarizations, either vertical and, and horizontal, or right and left circularly polarized, it's all degenerate. So we can pick whichever basis we, we please. Uh, but the key point is that there's a resonant peak here and, and there are actually two modes that are hidden inside there and they're, they're perfectly degenerate in absence of anything that's breaking the symmetry. Okay, and the way, one way or the way we will describe this dipole resonance is in terms of equation of motion for collective coordinates, so the collective center of mass position and momentum degree of freedom describing this uh, electron C that's oscillating back and forth here. Uh, and by essentially averaging, doing phase space averaging, we can derive equations of motion for these collective variables. And they look essentially just like classical harmonic oscillators. Um, and in this equation, just to highlight, uh, there's an external drive, which is there to excite this. And we can see what the absorption curve looks like. Uh, and also included in intrinsic damping, not because it's essential in any way for the effect that I want to describe, but just because, well, for one thing, in you know, real life, it's there as, as you know, response to Tammy's question. Of course, these plasmons have a finite lifetime. 
Uh, but also because I want to look at steady states, it's important to have some at least tiny damping there to kill transients so we can ask what's the steady state behavior. So I have a question. Um, yeah. If I'm, uh, so why isn't there an anomalous velocity in the first line? Is it the, do the contributions from different electrons cancel or? Excellent question. So, so for now, this is meant to describe uh, time reversal invariant material, uh, which has zero hall conductivity. And in that case, exactly as you said, uh, we would see that the contributions of all the different electrons would cancel. So even if, say, inversion symmetry is broken, so some electrons have a positive Berry curvature, an equal number would have negative and they would cancel. Uh, okay. And that has to be the case because we need to see that those two uh, modes, the two polarizations are degenerate. Uh, and the next thing I was going to say is precisely answering your question. In the case where the Berry flux is non-zero, meaning we have a net Hall conductivity, then the anomalous velocity-like term that shows up for the collective coordinates has the Berry flux as its prefactor. Okay. Uh, and by the way, so this Berry flux is essentially the Hall conduct, at least the intrinsic part of the Hall conductivity in units of E squared over H. So if it would be one, it would mean we have E squared of, over H of, of Hall conductivity. Mm -hmm. uh, so exactly as you anticipated, in a material where time reversal symmetry is broken and we're allowed to have a, a Hall conductivity and when it exists, we do get a term here, which looks like the anomalous velocity for a single particle, except now it's describing this collective particle that describes the motion of the entire Fermi C. Okay, so, so then we can ask what's the effect of this term now on the dipole resonance? And due to this cross product, it introduced a chirality to the system. Uh, and that's going to, as, just as you would expect for some kind of Hall conductivity, it has a handedness to it. And it'll split that previously degenerate resonance into two. Uh, one that moves faster and one that moves slower because of this intrinsic handedness of the system. And the splitting between those peaks is proportional to this Berry flux or to the Hall conductivity, uh, which is present in the material. So, so up till now, this, this Hall conductivity, which here, that's some fixed property of whatever this material was. Uh, and now to come back to this idea of feedback, we're going to see how it can become a dynamical property, which depends on the excitation of this plasmonic motion itself. OK, so key idea then is that this anomalous velocity-like term and the very flux that comes into it itself is now a dynamical variable in the problem. Uh, and it's a function of the total electric field which is present. So this is the electric, remember the electrons inside here, they're seeing both the driving field, which is exciting the plasmonic mode, plus a big enhancement coming from the internal field and whatever the internal dynamics are doing. And so if we start out with the time reversal invariant material, uh, but we manage to excite, say one of the circularly polarized modes of this disk, then the electrons will see a circularly polarized component of the field and thereby, although Berry flux was zero in equilibrium, it'll become non-zero. Uh, and that will lead to feedback here. And you can see that this has made the equations nonlinear because now the uh, total electric field, the total has a part which is from the drive plus the internal one. And the internal field is proportional to this displacement, as you see down here. Okay, so, so now we have some nonlinearity which will come through here, and that's uh, where interesting behavior will, will arise. Okay, so, so just to briefly see the physical mechanism uh, through which this very flux or Hall conductivity is, is generated, uh, if we take graphene as an example, so there's nothing really particularly special about graphene for this mechanism. We just need a multi-band materials where we can uh, have some hybridization that can lead to uh, some Berry curvature. Uh, if we look at the dispersion in the two valleys, K and K prime, then uh, in the situation where it's say doped, graphene is doped a little bit above the Dirac point here, then these arrows, 
which represent the pseudo spins in sublattice space of the electrons uh, in the material, they rotate in the equatorial plane of the block sphere as you go around the Fermi surface. Uh, and if you would calculate the Berry phase that you get by going around the Fermi surface, which is equal to the Berry flux, you said, uh, you'll essentially get zero. It'll cancel between the two sides. Um, okay. Now, in the presence of a circularly polarized field with a frequency which is less than twice the Fermi energy, so nothing is being absorbed here. H bar omega connects filled states with filled states. It's really an off resonant effect, but if you would look, say, just in second order perturbation theory, what happens to the wave functions at the Fermi surface? They're off resonantly hybridized with states of the valence band far away. Uh, but that's enough to tip those pseudo spins out of the equatorial plane of the block sphere. And now, if you calculate the Berry phase going around the Fermi surface, you'll find that the contributions don't vanish when you add them up from the two values. You get a net Hall conductivity that comes out. Uh, and this saddle over here, it's not so crucial exactly, you know, what it is, but essentially it tells you if you do the simplest thing, which is just look at this field in, in second order perturbation theory, you would get a net uh, time averaged contribution or DC contribution to the Berry flux, which is proportional to the difference in intensities of left and right handed uh, fields that are applied. Uh, and the fact that it goes like the difference of intensities is something that you can see has to be the case because if there would be equal intensity, that would mean we have a linearly polarized field and, and that doesn't uh, introduce any chirality and it doesn't break time reversal symmetry. So we really need an imbalance between left and right uh, to see something. Uh, and knowing that is, is enough to understand the effect. Um, so, so basically now what we want, need to do is take this equation of motion uh, and combine it here with this idea that the DC part of the Berry flux, which is generated, is proportional to the difference in left and right handed components of the electric field that the electrons are seen. Uh, and we can relate the motion of the electrons to these left and right handed components by just decomposing into some components, Z plus and Z minus, which just represent the left and right handed components uh, of the motion of the, the internal field here. Okay, so there's some proportionality constant, but the important point is now we have this feedback. Uh, and now we're going to analyze what's the nonlinear dynamics that comes out of the system through, through that interplay, that the Berry curvature depends on uh, whether or not the system is exhibiting any circulating motion. Okay, actually, any, any question about the mechanism through which Berry curvature is generated? Back here. Okay, if not, then we'll go to the result. So, the result is a phenomenon that we gave a name because we were bored and had to have fun. Uh, we called it baryogenesis, uh, which means a spontaneous generation of a berry flux uh, via this collective orbital magnetization that develops uh, when we drive the system using a driving field. It's, you know, there's no magnetism applied externally, and the drive is not chiral, it preserves time reversal symmetry, but it's really the uh, internal dynamics of the system that give rise to this very flex generation, breaking the symmetry. Okay, so, so to understand what happens, let's just imagine that now we're driving this system with a continuous wave excitation at a frequency which is a little bit detuned from the peak of the resonance down here on the shoulder. Uh, and it's a linearly polarized field. Okay, so as you may expect, if you use a weak linearly polarized field and you ask what happens to the electrons, they'll respond with linearly polarized motion with some amplitude. Uh, what I'm gonna plot on the right over here is uh, as a function of the amplitude of this exciting field, uh, what is this steady state Berry flux generated? And this is basically kind of an order parameter or a stand in telling us whether there's any circulating motion generated in the system or not. So when it's zero, that means we have linearly polarized motion. If it's non-zero, it means it's either left or right-handed. It could be elliptical or, or circular motion. Okay, so that's what happens for a weak drive. Now, if you increase the excitation 
uh, amplitude, the motion will stay linearly polarized up until some critical uh, drive amplitude, at which point the linearly polarized solution becomes unstable. And the reason it becomes unstable is that electrons are now they're shaking back and forth quite a bit. Uh, and they, you know, they know, they don't know anything, but to some extent they know that if there would be some fluctuation which kicks, uh, the, kicks them and initiates some kind of rotating or circulating motion, then the amplitude is big enough that that circulating motion will generate some Hulk conductivity. Uh, and what that'll do, since we're sitting over here on the shoulder of the resonance, that would start to split the resonance. Uh, and now the peak is moving closer to the frequency of excitation, and there'll be uh, an amplification, some gain due to that. So past this critical point, uh, fluctuations basically are, are amplified due to this resonant enhancement, uh, and the linearly polarized solution will be unstable, and the system will spontaneously decide whether to pick uh, right or left-handed circular uh, polarization. Uh, Mark, now, yeah. so, um... Do you need to have a drive uh, for to kick this off and you need to maintain it or can the system have a spontaneous fluctuation uh, of the appropriate amplitude and then get stuck in this um, bacteriogenesis phase? Uh, good question. So, um, I mean, if you just had the system sitting at equilibrium, when you did nothing to it, it wouldn't uh, manage to get here because it needs a finite amplitude of excitation. Yeah, uh, but suppose you have some some finite temperature, and there's some very very low probability that there, you know, at some point there was a plasmon set up with appropriate amplitude. Yeah, yeah it's a good question. I I, I imagine that uh, we'd have to see, you know, how high would the temperature have to be in order to uh, get enough amplitude of that plasmonic excitation. Sure, sure. It's, probably not, it's, it's probably not, you know, sensible in that sense. But the question is more, I guess, theoretical, like, shouldn't like a system just, spawn, I mean, technically, if it's possible, and even if you have an extremely rare fluctuation, would it always yes. lead the system to instability? I mean, presumably, that doesn't happen because there's a decay rate. Yeah. Of, of which, which eventually can damp things. Um, Right, there's a related question I think we could ask, which is suppose we just, you know, kicked it, just in one pulse, just excited it, and then yeah. asked, and let it evolve freely. Uh, and if, if it kicked beyond this threshold, then it could spontaneously, you know, start circulating in that way. And right. you can imagine the thermal excitation that managed to kick it there. But as you said, because there's some damping, uh, it will then eventually decay back down. It wouldn't be able to be self-supporting. Right. And is there any possibility of using topology and, or other tricks to make it self-supporting even with a finite amount of damping? Hard to imagine, but we can think about it. Uh, I mean, if there's damping, somehow energy is going to be lost and it's hard to okay. see. We need to supply it somehow. That's uh, right. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is this is uh, this is the spontaneous symmetry breaking that I wanted to uh, present, and you know the direction is chosen randomly as with any kind of magnetization by some fluctuation that decides which way it's going to go. Uh, so so since it is a spontaneous symmetry breaking, I think it's useful maybe to say which symmetry actually was broken, uh, just to make it clear, because. Sometimes it's useful to think about magnetism as breaking time reversal symmetry, but this is a driven system uh, and there's damping. So there wasn't time reversal symmetry really to begin with, uh, but there's another more robust symmetry which was present, which is a mirror symmetry, which also prevents all conductivity from forming. Uh, and that's really the symmetry that's being broken here. So if we look in the presence of the linearly polarized drive, uh, the equation of the motion still have a mirror symmetry. Initially they had full rotation symmetry. Uh, with the drive present, selects out one direction where there's now a mirror plane. Uh, but once there's a circularly polarized or some circulating motion that develops, uh, that circulating motion is not invariant under this mirror symmetry. Uh, and at the same time, the term that's generated in the equation of motion also then starts to violate the, the mirror symmetry of the system. 
So, so this is a spontaneous chirality. It's a spontaneous breaking of mirror symmetry. That's the, the symmetry that's broken here. Um, what else? Uh, I can briefly mention that um, there's, I don't want to say it's an order of the phase transition because it's a non-equilibrium non phenomenon and whether we're going to call it phase transition or not, we can discuss, but there are two cases for the bifurcation. I think it's a better language to use for it, which is uh, this pitchfork can either go sort of the open to the right or open to the left. And you've seen sort of some sketches going both ways. And, and the point is that actually this system has two different possibilities for whether uh, it's essentially a continuous phase transition or discontinuous. Uh, and it depends on the ratio of the damping to uh, the detuning from resonance that you pick for where you drive it. So if the damping is low uh, and you go close to resonance, then you tend to find this discontinuous type of transition. If damping is high, then you'll tend to favor this continuous type of spontaneous symmetry breaking transition. Um, and the last thing, I think just to kind of put it back into some context and how to think about it, we can compare this type of plasmonic non-equilibrium magnetism to just familiar equilibrium ferromagnetism. So, so in equilibrium, ferromagnetism arises from exchange interaction, from, you know, from Coulomb interaction, but it's really the exchange part that says that uh, you know, electrons of parallel spins would prefer to they'd prefer to align their spins because then the short range part of Coulomb gets automatically uh, eliminated. Uh, and the way we get into a magnetic phase is by decreasing temperature and thinking about minimizing the free energy. So that's sort of the, the paradigm for finding magnetism in equilibrium. Here, this phenomenon I described is sort of a, it's a dynamical magnetism. And it's really the AC part of the, the Hartree part of the interaction, the mean field part that gives rise to it uh, through this way that it modified the band structure for the electrons. Um, and since it's a non-equilibrium property, there isn't really free energy that we can think about minimizing. It's, it's really a dynamical transition related to stability of fixed points that, that changes as we change the drive amplitude. So that's sort of just the way, at least mentally, that I compartmentalize these, these phenomena and how they're related and, and also different from each other. OK, so I think that's a good time to close. We have time for questions. Uh, so the summary here, which I guess I probably don't need to read to you. You can read it yourself. Um, and I'm happy to discuss further. And yeah, any questions you have, please feel free to ask. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark, for this wonderful talk. Um, we had some questions during the talk, but I'm sure uh, there are some others. Uh, so whoever wants to talk and to ask can just unmute. Yeah, I don't mind asking a question. Um, so, so Mark, th th thanks for the talk. It was really nice. Uh, uh, I was wondering about the, the if the size of the effect. So, uh, it, so what you're saying that if I if I shine, let's say, uh, um, a polarized light on on graphene, I would get a hull voltage. How how big would of a voltage would you expect in in practice? Is the question about this this uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking effect, or actually back to just uh... no, no, the, even the spontaneous one. So, so the one you showed at the end uh, when you have a but yeah, you show this spontaneous as a function of intensity, I guess. I mean, you do expect a whole voltage appearing, I guess, no? Right, so, so in, this, um, in this case, uh, so here we're considering an isolated disk and asking about the, uh, its collective its dipole mode of it. Uh, so what we'll find in once the symmetry is broken is, okay, so then now there's this, uh, uh, rotating dipole, which is there. Uh, there isn't a really a DC hull voltage in this setup. It's all AC. Uh, question would be how to measure it. So, so we thought not about measuring uh, the hull voltage, but uh, one thing you can measure because now there is actually a circulating uh, current is that there will be a magnetic field which is produced, which you could sense, uh, say, with a ma magnetometer, a squid or an NV center, something like that. Um, actually, I have uh, estimates. Sorry, uh, here. So, so in this case, we estimated uh, somewhere between 0.1 and one microtesla uh, 
a magnetic field generated due to the circulating current that's there. Um, and the other way probably to observe it would be say, pick your favorite um, measure of transversal symmetry breaking like curve rotation or something optically, you could have a, a pump probe kind of thing and probe it that way. Uh, measuring the whole voltage, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm worried about putting any kind of contact there may disrupt the plasmon and, and kill its quality factor. Oh, hi. Really, really a pedagogically very good talk. I, I think I understood some things, which is great. How circular symmetric does this disk have to be? Ah, good question. So, uh, yeah, if if there was some ellipticity to the disk, then of course that would also split the resonance, but it would split it in the linearly polarized linear polarization basis, which is not what we want. And so then this effect, which favors the circular polarization basis, that's a win. Uh, over the natural splitting from ellipticity, uh, I hope I still have here. So uh, we looked into it a bit. Um, there's also some, just from using the linearly polarized drive that actually also induces itself uh, some, uh, not ellipticity to the disk itself, but some anisotropy. Uh, and what we found was the instability was, um, it survived up to, you know, several percent of ellipticity there, but you know much more than that, and and then the broken symmetry of the geometry overwhelms the effect. So it has to be you know fairly circular, but not perfectly circular. And, and so, given the fact that this is a plasmonic effect at the origin in that sense, and now you're going to measure magnetic field possibly or dynamic magnetic field, do the edge states of the graphene as a cut up into kind of a circle, will they start? playing a role or will, will, will they kind of wash out my signal or so I'm an uh, experimentalist and that's, so that's why I'm asking this. <laughs> ed edge states, which edge states do you have in, in mind? Well, if I cut up graphene, if I cropped up a graphene state sheet, I'm going to have zigzag or, or, oh. or other kind of, you know, like at atomic level. Yeah, the role of the edges. So that's a good question. You know, what, what's the role of the, you know, possibly rough edges there? Uh, one thing is that they may, so I think, you know, if, if it was nice and very clean, it shouldn't really matter too much. Um, but if there's, you know, junk on the edges and lots of defects, there's a chance it may kill the quality factor. And if the quality factor goes down, then the threshold drive strength goes up. You have to somehow beat that. Uh, we really, you know, we want a resonant enhancement and the sharper the resonance, the better. Uh, one way to get around that is actually, if you would imagine a big graphene flake uh, and have some, which is you know, doped to some level, but then if you're in the middle of it, you had some kind of gate which changed the doping. So you'd have sort of a, a disc shaped region in the middle of a larger, uh, larger graphene flake, then you wouldn't have a physical edge at the edge of your effective disc here. Uh, and that uh, might give you free you from worrying about the effects of the edge. Yeah. Also, maybe some pattern I, electric could do something similar. Sorry, uh, maybe I, I can ask a question. Um, hi, Mark, um, Dave Cook. I'm an ex also an experimentalist. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so I had some question about uh, the various timescales involved in this um, sort of experiment. So there's there's the, the periodicity of the, um, of the plasmon wave. There are... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's the dampening uh, time uh, governed by the rate. And then there's the, you know, the things that Mark alluded to, things like block oscillation times, which have, are connected to the drive field. So mm. I imagine that all of these sort of interplay um, and sort of, uh, you know, develop a window of opportunity to see this type of effect. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious as to where this window might be relative to all the, the different, you know, multi-dimensional timescales. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so maybe I can just come back to. Uh, here, just okay. So, so there's time and there's energy scales. So, so the time scale, the one related to block oscillations, uh, I guess. So, because here we're working at AC, uh, 
let me let me turn around this way. Uh, if you look in you know somewhere around here, slightly above the threshold where it's gotten into this broken symmetry state, uh, and you ask, take the Fermi C, what kind of amplitude in momentum space? Uh, how big is that oscillation here? How big are we talking? Uh, and for for the Fermi energy of 150 or so MeV that we we looked at. Uh, the oscillation amplitude in K was like a 1% of KF. So it's really a tiny, tiny oscillation in momentum space. So, so we're nowhere near this thing exploring the entire Brillouin zone. It's really small amplitude oscillations of the Fermi C. Uh, and then in terms of the damping time, that's basically characterized by the quality factor, which is here. Uh, and so quality factor of 100 means we have you know, 100 periods before this thing decays. Uh, and that's, you know, by, by these calculation, that's plenty good. That's actually a very high quality graphene sample. If you would go down to much smaller quality factors, uh, we'd have to go to larger amplitudes. And we, you know, we focused on this regime where it's more favorable within what's been demonstrated experimentally. Right. Uh, but I guess since that's, you know, I, I guess, that my, I guess that my question is what goes into the quality factor? So there's things like momentum scattering rates for the, the currents, the microscopic currents that you're driving. So which mm -hmm. fundamentally is, you know, determined by all the scattering mechanisms that are happening in your real material. So right. uh, um, I'm sort of uh, trying to get at, you know, what, what are the, the you know, the limitations on purity of the material, what sort of temperatures are, are accessible? Uh, mm -hmm. for this sort of thing because you know graphene momentum scattering times can be very very uh, short right so i mean this this quality factor of 100 was measured in graphene so it's definitely doable there uh i think you know it should be high quality uh you know probably boron nitride encapsulated if possible so it's actually what they said in that experiment when they reached this high quality factor was it's actually um the substrate, which was limiting their quality factor, because the electric field lines go out in three dimensions. And so still, if there's exit, if the electric field, which is penetrating into the substrate, can excite all kinds of impurities, uh, that's actually what was limiting them. So they said, you know, in order to go further, we have to clean up the substrate as well. So first is getting to high quality, high mobility graphene, and then actually making sure the substrate itself is, is you know, not limiting. OK, thanks. Maybe uh, just a small follow-up question. So are you predicting that a linearly polarized light can actually open up a gap eventually in graphene? How big is this gap? And can I probe it? Maybe Dave can probe it. Uh, <clears throat> That's a good question. So so one thing I uh, want to emphasize, I think the picture here I can use. Uh, so the, the frequency of this plasmon mode and of the drive, because they're comparable, is something down here. In fact, in the for the numbers, the estimates I gave you, it's, it's I don't know three times less than than this. So uh, it's at a frequency which, yeah, as I mentioned before, I guess it's it's you know sort of connecting filled states with other filled states. So in principle, it's true that some kind of gap will open here once circularly or some circulating motion develops, uh, but it's not a gap at the Fermi energy. It's somewhere deep below. Uh, and, you know, it's possible that maybe spectroscopically you can see it because if you could do STM or something, you would see that there's a gap in density of states down there. Uh, but yeah, it's not, it's not a gap that you would, you know, get a, quantized Hall conductivity out of because it's always going to be deep below the Fermi energy here. And, and I haven't tried to estimate what the size would be. It's a good question. Uh, we should check. But I guess um, the, the other question is, do, does the population of bands change as a result of this? Like it should, right? Some, some electrons might go to side bands. Uh, right, so because the drive is so far off resonance, uh, really, the change to the wave functions at the Fermi energy is quite small. Uh, 
And so if you, at least you imagine turning it on, you know, adiabatically that the amplitude of the drive ramps up slowly, then the electrons at the Fermi energy just will follow into their new uh, states. Uh, so, so it won't disrupt the distribution too much. Uh, inevitably, there'll be inevitably there'll be some amount of heating which would add some, say, increase the effective temperature there. But as long as the temperature remains small compared to the Fermi energy, it doesn't really affect the total Berry flux very much. Uh, so, at least from this effect, it's, it's kind of insensitive to that. Great, thanks. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Yeah, I, I just have a follow-up question to my um, spontaneous. Can you can you uh, show what happens to this diagram, the, the this critical field, when you have zero or like infinitesimally small damping? Oh. Um... Yeah, so as you decrease the damping, this, this thing is going to become much deeper. Uh, I guess you're asking whether the critical drive strength is going to go to zero. Well, yeah, and and because, you know, this reminds uh, me of this original thing that Vilcek proposed for time crystals, which subsequently people said cannot happen. You right. know, this round circular ring in which current starts uh, running in the ground state. It just, I don't know, <laughs> it's so, something has to, I don't know. It's, what, have you thought of the comparison? Like, what? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not a ground state property, but uh, but in the in the case of um, dissipation going, yeah. Um, mm, I mean, you know, I, I guess the question is, you know, even if there's no dissipation system doesn't spontaneously have plasmons that just get excited to find an amplitude, right? So, uh, I mean, there's always a very, very tiny probability. It's finite. It's not, it's not zero. It right. Lead to an avalanche. Question is, is that theoretically impossible? Mm. I mean, there must be something preventing that. Otherwise, we would say that this is a time. I don't know. Right. Uh, well, no, I mean, time crystals, strictly speaking, was supposed to be a ground state phenomenon. Uh, right. So okay. not. It's, equal, it's an equilibrium, whether uh, it could, you know, break time, uh, continuous time translation. Uh, mm, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't do that. But uh, I mean, it's an interesting question to, to see exactly Right. How to think about it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What exactly is what what happens as we take uh, the damping to zero? Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, thank you again, Mark, uh, for this uh, talk. And um, so anyone who wants can actually stay on or just staying to chat. Some of my group members are going to stay. Uh, otherwise, I uh, can just show your appreciation and uh, leave. Um, yeah, and whoever uh, is not staying, uh, see you next Thursday. Thanks, Mark. That was a great talk. I have to go there. Thanks. Good to see you. Tell me you're on mute. We don't hear you. I've been saying so many things. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, starting to introduce uh, people. So oh. you see uh, Ranjani Sishadri, uh, who is my former postdoc and is in between postdocs, uh -huh. uh, waiting for a visa to go to Israel oh. and work with, uh, I don't know if you know uh, Ganit. Um, Maiden? Last name. Yeah. Yeah. Maiden. 
Cool. Yeah, so she's going to go work with her. Uh, then we also have my PhD student, uh, Ben Levitan, um, right here, and Bill Fuong. Hi. And my screen is cutting, so I don't know if we have. <laughs> There are some other people without a camera, so I, and I don't know who they are. So you can introduce yourself, people with no camera. Or maybe they're not really there. Possible too. Yeah, I'm used to that from the classes I teach. There's always somebody that stays on Yeah. <laughs> um, right after. And then I'm like, do you have any questions? Why did you stay? <laughs> I just want to look like you're in class. It seems like Michael doesn't have a camera or a microphone even available, so I, I don't oh. know if you hear from them. Oh, well. Wow. Well, at least hopefully as a speaker. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, uh, what have you been up to? Pandemic thing right now, so... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I am basically uh, working on uh, Tammy. I was working on the optical response of topological insulators and trying to see how these pump probe methods might be able to see a flow k state being created. Uh -huh. So yeah, so 